Text 29. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Ramatya Charja Pramukhan Hishushminaha Rajunda Sambam of Sitadhyo Para Yaschahrita Bhama Vade Sahasrasha Yeah, I'll just read them. Yeah, the lady, Virya, Prowers, Shukena, by payment of the price. Hirtaha, taken away by force. Swayamvare, in the open selection of the bridegroom. Pramatya, harassing. Chaidya, King Shishupal. Pramukhan, headed by he positively. Shushminaha, all very powerful. Pradyumna, Pradyumna, Krishna's son, Samba, Samba, Amba, Amba, Sutta Adayaha, children, Aparaha, other ladies, Yaha, those, Cha also, Aharitaha, similarly brought, Boma Vadhe, after killing kings, Sahasra Shaha, by the thousands. Translation, report, Mashila Prabhupada. The children of these ladies are Pradyumna, Samba, Amba, etc. Ladies like Rukmini, Satchabama, and Jambavati were forcibly taken away by him from their Svayambara ceremonies after he defeated many powerful kings, headed by Shishupal. And other ladies were also forcibly taken away by him after he killed 
Bomasur, and thousands of his assistants. All of these ladies are glorious. Purport. Exceptionally qualified daughters of powerful kings were allowed to make a choice of their own bridegrooms in open competition, and such ceremonies were called swayambara, or selection of the bridegroom. Because the swayambara was an open competition between the rival and valiant princes, such princes were invited by the father of the princess, and usually there were regular fights between the invited princely order in a sporting spirit. But it so happened that sometimes the belligerent princes were killed in such marriage fighting, and the victorious prince was offered the trophy princess for whom so many princes died. Rukmini, the principal queen of Lord Krishna, was the daughter of the king of Vidarbha, who wished that his qualified and beautiful daughter be given away to Lord Krishna. But her eldest brother wanted her to be given away to King Shishupal, who happened to be a cousin of Krishna. So there was open competition, and as usual, Lord Krishna emerged successful after harassing Shishupal and other princes by his unrivaled prowess. Rukmini had ten sons, like Pradyumna. There were other queens also taken away by Lord Krishna in a similar way. Full description of this beautiful booty of Lord Krishna will be given in the tenth canto. There were 16,100 beautiful girls who were daughters of many kings and were forcibly stolen by Bhomasura, who kept them captive for his carnal desire. These girls prayed piteously to Lord Krishna for their deliverance, and the merciful Lord, called by their fervent prayer, released them all by fighting and killing Bhomasura. All these captive princes were then accepted by the Lord as his wives, although in the estimation of society, they were all fallen girls. The all-powerful Lord Krishna accepted the humble prayers of these girls and married them with the adoration of queens. So altogether, Lord Krishna had 16,108 queens at Dwarka, and in each of them he got 10 children. All these children grew up, and each had as many children as a father. The aggregate of the family number in, numbered in the millions. You can look it up in another canto. So, it's a little hard for me to uh, picture Lord Krishna as a king in Dwarka. We used to have a picture back there, and it did show him sitting on a couch, and he had a very bejeweled sword by his side, and a big helmet, and sitting on these fancy cushions. And I don't know, it's just hard for me to picture him um, in this scene with so many princesses and, and um, and valiant um, clothes and everything like that. But uh, he is the origin of everything. So he is also the origin of, of family life and of, of this bond with, with children. So we can understand that he's extraordinary though. He's beyond the, the mundane thought of, of family life. Here we see 16,108 queens. And of course we know he had a palace for each one. And here we're hearing that he had so many many, many children. Um, I mean, most of us don't have pictures of, you know, Krishna and Satyabhama on our walls, do we? I mean, or, you know, maybe we have Krishna and Rukmini, Krishna, Rukmini Dwarkadish from L.A. or something like that, but most of us don't have um, pictures. Oh, there it is, yeah. Um, uh, but most of us think of Krishna more in the Vrindavan scene, but I kind of calculated that Krishna must have been in married life for about 100 years. So he, um, it's a big chunk of his, uh, his pastimes were in Dwarka. And um, here we are hearing about some of them. Um, in uh, different cultures, if you studied around the world, you'd find a, a big variety of matrimonial um, uh, traditions and values. Um, and I think it would be interesting to, to kind of compare them all, but I, I didn't get into that. But in general, the, the Vedic culture has a, a big chapter uh, of their uh, society is on marriage. Uh, and we all know that if you ever go at a certain time in India, I think it's springtime, the early springtime, all along the road, all you see are just marriages, one after another, huge, brilliant lights, and they have these big, huge halls for them. And it's a big, big affair, and it's, uh, 
a great concern for, for many uh, of, of the fathers that their kid and their daughters isn't married. Even I think Prabhupada said that he was you know he was worried sometime that his daughter wasn't married. So this this is going on um, still today. That it, it's it's a big samskar. And when I think of some scars, I think of scars. That they're actually very deep impressions that, they, that you uh, never forget. It has a story behind it. And so this, especially marriage, is a, is a big thing. It goes on for weeks in, in India and in, in the tradition. tradition. I, I remember uh, Lakshmani and um, Malati got invited to uh, one of Radha Swami's disciples who was getting somebody married and they were flown in from wherever they were, were in the world and they went to this place and the minute they drived up they were giving, giving uh, new cloth, new saris for each day, for each uh, thing that went on during the day. They had a change of clothes, every single person got it. And then there was a big polo match in the middle of the day and they, I mean it was just like, oof, I mean way beyond we could ever imagine. So these were big affairs so that you would never forget that this was a lifetime um, vow that was never to be broken. Um, and I mean, it's now in the Vedic cultures it's probably a little controversial, but, um, but it was accepted that way. We can see that even like the arranged marriage, that was also very accepted at that time. Prabhupada uh, said that he was, I think he was betrothed at at like 11 years old, his wife was like six or seven, something like that. So um, Prabhupada accepted it, and this was kind of the standard. And um, I st still, I think some, some marriages are arranged and it's still going on, but the, the marriage vow is, is taken very seriously. And here we can see that um, Krishna took it very seriously. He, um, he married all these different um, uh, young ladies for different purposes. Um, because it, it bears a great weight on the society, um, marriages, if they're, if they're, not, um, they're not strong and they're not uh, predominant in society, then uh, we hear that there's an unwanted population. And there's disruption in the homes, disruptions in, in many people's uh, lives for their whole life. So um, we understand that when Prabhupada came here to the West, it was a whole different scenario. He, he came and saw that the men and women were all kind of had loose relationships and no one took anything very seriously or very responsible as far as a marriage vow, um, just living together. And um, very relaxed um, family relationships. Um, the kids were leaving home, no big deal, you know, as, at a young age, as soon as they could. Um, and the lack of respect for families, members, um, he, he was pretty shocked at that also. Very different than the Vedic standard. So he had to, um, he had to deal with that and, and, um, and then he had to deal with you know, the, the divorce situation. Of course, in the Vedic culture, there was, Prabhupada said there wasn't even a word for it. That it, it just didn't happen. It was just, you know, that was your vow and that was it. Um, you get what you get, and you deal with what you get. Um, I remember we were in uh, Mayapur in, in Sridhar Maharaj, uh, the, the Jolly Swami. He was, he was uh, very sick, and we, we, uh, it was very soon before he left. We took the girls, the ashram, to visit him, and he was uh, still very jolly. And uh, he was trying to give some advice to the girls, and, and he said, ah, just Pick any, any men, they're all the same, you know, they just pick one and you'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, of course he was sannyas, he didn't realize it. Um, <laughs> but it, these days, you know, um, well, in the 50s and 60s, um, when I was a kid uh, in school and things like that, if it was like divorce, it was like hush, hush. You didn't say that word in public. It was like, take it, divorce. You know, you, it was... Was, uh, but not heard of. It was just very, um, it was, wasn't accepted totally. But now it's, you know, it's like, how many divorces have you had, you know? So uh, it's when things get a little uncomfortable and when the things are inconvenient and the sense gratification isn't there, then simply change partners. 
Um, and so Papa was very uh, uh, against this. And he was um, very firm in the beginning. He actually married the couples to, to avoid um, illicit connection. He said, okay, then you all just get married. And he performed, actually, uh, marriages in person. And then it came to the point where some wanted divorce. And that's when he, he made a couple of exceptions. And then after that, he just kind of washed his hands of the whole thing. He was disappointed and said, I'm not marrying anyone anymore. You, you all deal with it. And, um, so uh, that was unfortunate. Um, but Krishna set the, the standard. Um, 16,108 wives. Of course, Prabhupada nipped that in the bud. He said, one wife only. First of all, it's illegal, and you can't even maintain one around here. What less uh, two or three or a thousand. So Krishna set a, a standard that is not to be imitated, but it is he, we could see that when Narada Muni, he visited all the palaces uh, to see what Krishna was doing in all the palaces with the queens. And he, he realized that they all were satisfied. Every single queen was totally satisfied. And he was faithful to all of them and, um, and gave them all wonderful children and everything. So this is the standard we should maintain is to um, make sure that our family members are Krishna conscious and very satisfied. Um, and so here we're reading about some of the um, marriage maneuvers that uh, Krishna performed. Um, pretty outstanding, pretty uh, much, we definitely can't imitate these. Um, but it was the, the standard in those days that if there was a, uh, the, the elite club of the kings and princes and princesses that uh, a, a princess could choose her husband uh, under certain circumstances, and the father would arrange sometimes competition. And so uh, uh, there is one, um, one queen that, there, that was uh, pretty mellow um, in the marriage thing, and that was Bhadra. Bhadra actually had a crush on Krishna. She had heard about um, Krishna. He had never seen him, but he just... She had heard about him, how wonderful he was and everything, and she just had a crush on him, and she, her father realized that, and so he, he made some arrangements. It actually was arranged marriage by her father that Krishna would come and marry her, and um, he did that. And then his father gave, uh, her father gave a huge dowry that would put to shame anything that we've ever heard of here. And um, there was a big pomp and ceremony, and, and that was a, one of his marriages, one of the more calm ones. And then there was the, this, here it's mentioned about the Swambara, where, um, where you, you get to choose um, by the different uh, princes that were invited to come. And so there was this one Lakshmana, and her, her father um, arranged an uh, interesting um, competition. It's similar to where how Draupadi got uh, taken away by the Pandavas. And that was when um, he, uh, Lakshmana's father arranged for, for the fish again, for the fish to be up and the reflection in the water. But this time, the fish was covered with a cloth. So you're not going to get a very good reflection in the water, but you still have to look at the reflection. You don't look up, you look at the reflection and you shoot your arrow and try to pierce the eye of the the fish. So there were many princes there and they looked at the situation and some of them, first of all, couldn't even um, get the bow uh, tied up. And so they went home. They left, went, went home with their tail between their um, legs. And then there, there's some, they, uh, they could string the bow and they would shoot. They missed the target. They all left. They went home to bears. And then another one, they could string the bow, shoot the target, but none of them, even Arjuna, Arjuna shot and hit the target, but he didn't hit the eye. And so then only Krishna kept step forward, of course, no problem, um, shooting the eye of the um, fish. And he, and she came forward, Lakshmana came forward with all her beautiful bangles and everything and gorgeous and put the garland on Krishna, and then Krishna looked over and saw the princess getting kind of red in the face, a little fumy, a little angry. And so 
he says, Daruka, quick, come. And they, he put Swai, uh, Lakshman on the chariot, picked up his Sharanga bow, and they took off, and the princess followed. And he ended up having to uh, uh, cut off some of their arms, some of their hands, some of their legs, some of their heads. And, but he, uh, he, it was just like taking a, a lion, taking a deer away from a pack of deer. He just, she just was taken away and then married um, very uh, ceremoniously. Um, Rukmini, we, it's mentioned here, you all know that, that story. And she also had a crush on Krishna and wrote that letter and Krishna kidnapped her. And he also, uh, there were some objections to his, um, his, you know, catching her um, from having to marry that creep Shishupal. So uh, he, they weren't very happy with that, especially her brother Rupmi, and ended up that Krishna spanked him, didn't kill him, but spanked him, and sent him. He couldn't even go home because he vowed he wouldn't go home, so he had to go somewhere else for a long time. So that, that was that story. And then there was a, another competition, a very interesting competition. This was King Nanajit, and he had a, a wife, I mean a daughter, Sacha, who was of marriageable age and had a lot of uh, uh, princes wanting to marry her. So he, he made a tough competition. He got seven um, really ferocious bulls and put them in a ring and the competitor would have to tame them and bring them down. And so some of the uh, princes came and looked at the situation and uh, every attempt they got struck by the bulls. Uh, if you've ever seen a bullfight, not a pretty scene, um, pretty scary. Actually near the temple in Buega, in, outside of um, Madrid, I've been there, there's a little teeny town and they actually have that crazy festival where the, everybody runs in the street and then they let the bulls out to, to run behind them and you're supposed to outrun the bulls? I mean, come on, you see, <laughs> see the people flying, you know, and getting gored and everything. Anyway, competition, whew, crazy. Anyway, they were, they were pretty much defeated by all the bulls and then Krishna um, came and they, it, was, uh, it was like play toys for him. He just, you know, he, he got their rings and he tied them all up and, and calmed them down and uh, won the hand of uh, Satya. And he also, uh, he, her father also gave a, a wonderful dowry. But the princes were not happy with that situation and they also started to attack, but Krishna defeated them all. So there was some bloodshed again. Uh, a little bit more civilized um, marriage was um, with Kalindi, who, is, uh, who had some nice living arrangement inside the Jamuna River. And she was a uh, personification of uh, the beautiful Jamuna. And she had a desire, a very deep desire to, to marry Krishna. And of course, Krishna knew this. And so there was an arrangement where Arjuna and Krishna were out hunt hunting, practicing hunting, and, and um, they were thirsty and went down to the Jamuna. And um, Arjuna was bending down, getting some water, and all of a sudden the, he sees this beautiful, beautiful young lady. And he actually commented, oh, you look like you're a marriageable age. Um, you know, who do you belong to? You know, who are you? You're really beautiful. And then he, she told her, her uh, intense desire to marry Lord Krishna. And he said, well, actually, I can arrange that. He's right over here. And so he um, went over and introduced them. And uh, Krishna was very happy to accept her as his wife. Um, so he took her back and her comment was that I am just so happy to become a sweeper in Lord Krishna's home. And he's so kind that he, he will accept me as, uh, as a, well, he will treat me like a wife. So she was very humble, very just happy to be in Krishna's presence. And then there's a, a two-in-one. Uh, Krishna gets two uh, wives in one 
pastime, and that's of the Shamataka Jewel. And um, so that story is quite complicated, but it ends up that um, uh, Sachabama's uh, father had this jewel, uh, the Shamataka Jewel, and it got stolen. And in doing so, uh, his brother uh, was killed, Prasena. And they thought it was Krishna. He thought it was Krishna. And so he, he uh, was very upset. And Krishna heard about that. Oh, I'm being, this is not right. I didn't do it. I've got to you know, honor my name. So I've got to go find that jewel and give it back and prove that I didn't kill Prasena. I didn't take the jewel. And uh, so he went and he found the jewel that had been uh, taken by um, one Jambavan, who's kind of, I guess he's kind of monkey-like. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. A bear, okay. Hairy guy. A hairy Krishna. <laughs> and he, uh, he took, so he had taken the jewel that was from the lion that killed Prasena, anyway, and gave it to his kids to play with. And so when Krishna found the jewel, he was very happy, but Jambavan was not happy. That, who, who, who are you? Come in here, take this, this my play toy from the kid. And so he got angry and challenged Krishna, and they fought 27 days. And, uh, and then Jambavan, who was a, actually a, uh, a follower of Lord Ram, loved Lord Ram, started to think that maybe this, is, this must be Lord Ram in some incarnation, because no one could fight me for 27 days. And so then he found that out, and he returned the the uh, jewel uh, to Krishna and also his daughter as, because he, was, he was, uh, felt very bad about fighting with his lord. So he uh, offered his daughter uh, Jambavan, Jambavati and Krishna was glad to accept. And so then he took the jewel back and um, Satyabhama's father was very ashamed that I, I, I you know, accused you of this, and I was wrong. She, he felt so bad. He says, "Please take my daughter also." And so, such a mama was given also to um, Krishna, and um, so he got two in one with that one. And then there's um, Mitravinda. Uh, she had a swayamvara, um, and her father invited many princesses, and Krishna also. And Krishna ended up defeating all the princes. And um, he caught her up because he could see some adverse um, uh, signs and caught her up and took her away. And he ended up having to defeat e even her brother. Um, so she was also one of Krishna's queens. I was in LA one time and Prabhupada was there. And Prabhupada was telling some of these stories about the bloodshed that one would have when uh, he would you know, prove his prowess to take the, the lady as his wife. And so he was saying that, yes, and they would take, he, he said, they would take the blood from the defeated prince and put it in their hair. And he went like that. And he says, that's why the women have that red kumkum now, he says, but it was really blood. He, he went like this and they would put it in his hair. And the, you can imagine the woman, but wow, yeah, now I really got me a husband, ain't gonna, no one's gonna get me. <laughs> And so he goes, is that all right? We can do that? And everybody goes, oh, I didn't know what to say. And Papa laughed. But it was, it was a nice pastime. Um, so Papa acknowledged that this did go on, and um, that's why the ladies put the red mark in their hair, but I guess you just put some paint or something. <laughs> like that. Um, I, I was reading the Chaitanya Bhagavad also that Lord Chaitanya, um, his mother, Sachi Mata, actually uh, had a matchmaker. So in those days, there were matchmakers. Uh, isn't there some story, a, a song, and uh, matchmaker, matchmaker, something? Anyway, it's a, the, it's many traditions there are matchmakers. And um, so he, they helped uh, with Lord Chaitanya's uh, arranging his marrying. That was Bhana Mali Krishna Mita. Uh-huh. And then um, we, Prabhupada mentioned, um, he, it was astrology, it was always like, you know, people always said to Prabhupada, you know, should we use astrology, you know, and this and that. 
you know, Bhaktisiddhanta was so good at it and everything. And Prabhupada said, you could use it for marriage just to, for compatibility. He says, that's good. And so I know that, that, that sometimes happens just to make sure everything's all right. Um, and then there's uh, the pastime of, um, well, well, actually, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But in, in ISKCON, the uh, householders, um, this was, this didn't really happen. Well, in the very beginning, Prabhupada, like I said, saw the matches that were already going on and made them get married. But he was actually very proud of his householders uh, because they were um, preachers. And they would go and, um, they, of course, they started the London Temple. Prabhupada was so proud of them. He, he said that they were better than the sannyasis who had tried to, in London, to, to start temples. So he was very proud that um, his married couples were taking up that, um, that sword of, of, to help with this movement. Um, but I can say for, for many uh, of, the, of the householders that we had our um, Bonaprost first. That actually we couldn't think about kids. We were, so, we were married so that we could start temples. And so we went, uh, so many stories of us, you know, okay, well, we need a temple here, so the temple president would call up this temple over here and match the two and say, okay, and then they should get married and go start this temple. And um, this actually went on. So we, we lived very austerely. We uh, lived in the temple. We didn't have homes. We, if, we, if we lived with our husband, it just had a curtain in between the different rooms of the, of the couples. Uh, so we had our Bonaparte first, and then we had our household life later, <laughs> which was topsy-turvy, backwards, but um, I don't know how all the, if we can ever figure out the percentage of, uh, of those marriages that lasted, maybe 50-50, I don't know, of the arranged marriages, um, but um, we did what Prabhupada wanted, and um, we helped, helped him with the, his mission. Uh, it's a little different these days. Um, we tried uh, some arranged marriages in the very beginning with the second generation. Didn't get off the ground. Nope. Just didn't make it. Um, so now you can go online. I think they have match, match web, websites so you can find your partners that way. And, or you can go to the university in Belgium or you can go to the bus tours and find your, you know, your mate. Or you can go to different seminars or Coolie Melos or whatever. There's different ways that it goes on now. But um, uh, the facilities uh, are there, and as most all, Papa said, all the women should get married and all the men should stay celibate. How's that going to work? Don't know. <laughs> it's, it's going on. Um, Krishna is setting the example that it's, it's natural. It's a natural thing that... Um, that there will be um, nice couples. Even in my, in the bushes in my front yard, um, there's a, a, a nice little pair of uh, cardinals. And they actually have their spouse um, for a lifetime. They don't change anything. They have, they have their one. I see them all the time. They have their nests every year and everything. So this is a nice example that it, it is natural and that we should make it as Krishna conscious as, as possible. Uh, nowadays, some of the <coughs> old Vedic standards um, are being challenged. I know whenever there's some weird thing going on in India that you know if someone's being forced now to get married or forced to change their religion because they're marrying someone else. It's big news, you know. So it it is definitely being challenged these days. Um, but the norm was that you would. Um, that it was unacceptable that if, here is described in this purport, that it's unacceptable that if a, a man uh, messed around with a woman, then th th that woman could not get remarried. Um, so here we see that Krishna made an exception, that he is so merciful that here at this, this story of uh, Bomasura's kidnapping all these, uh, the daughters of all these kings, um, he actually married them all. And Bomasura was actually a very, uh, very strong, very strong demon, and he conquered, was conquering the whole world. And, but he went beyond, he took a little step beyond his boundary, and he stole the earrings of Aditi. 
And then he went and stole Varuna's umbrella. Must have been a pretty good umbrella. And then, uh, then he started to, to make um, <clears throat> different settlements on Mount Meru. And then Indra said, whoa, this is, this is, going, this is getting scary because Indra really doesn't like to see his power being challenged. So he went to Krishna and told Krishna, look what this demon is doing. And he has all these queens too. He went and took them all for his own lusty desire and put them in there and something has to be done. And so um, Krishna said, oh, sounds pretty serious. So um, he uh, took his wife with him, Satchabama with him, and they got on Garuda and they went over to where this, uh, his kingdom was. But it was a, not just a, you know, a little you know, a palace or something that he lived in, but around the palace, this demon had um, gotten another demon to help make all these boundaries. So there was, there was first a boundary of electric wires and a big canal. And then if you made it through all that, then there was a, this gas called anila gas that must have been you know, deadly poisonous. And then there was huge, huge walls that you had to go through. And there were guards and military behind the guards. And so Krishna said, hmm, looks pretty interesting. And so he goes there and with his club, he, and his suit on chakra, he gets rid of the electric wires. He gets rid of the, um, the, the gets go over the canal. And then he, um, he, used, he blows his conch shell. And that conch shell literally broke the hearts, crushed the hearts of the fighters, of the military. And the sound vibration was so piercing that the, all the fighting instruments were just shattered. And then he got to the walls and he took his club and just beat all the walls down. So now he's, uh, he's uh, upset the Mura demon. The Mura demon who was living there comes out He's got five heads. And so he starts to roar like a lion. And that roar was so loud that it went in 10 directions and no one could, could stand its sound. And so Krishna, well, he came out with a trident too and he was going to poke Krishna. And so Krishna took two arrows and went zip, 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 and zipped all the five mouths of the demon. And then... Then the, then um, the Moor demon struck again, and um, he with a club. And so then Krishna said, okay, enough. You have all this arsenal, all these things here. And he just took his chakra and cut off the, all five heads on the ground. And so by then, Bomasura was getting pretty upset because he was arranging for all this to happen and to protect his um, kingdom. And so Bomasura comes out. And he comes out not alone. Does anybody remember what he brings with him? Elephants. And these aren't just regular elephants. Now, someone will have to tell me, but somehow or other, these elephants were special because they were raised on the seashore. Anybody know why elephants get worse when they're raised on the seashore? I don't know. <laughs> I just wonder if anyone knew. But they were pretty fierce elephants. And not only were they raised on the seashore, it says, but they, they were intoxicated. I mean, elephants are scary anyway, but an intoxicated elephant would be really scary. So anyway, he comes out with all these um, intoxicated elephants. And then he, he whips out a, uh, a special um, artillery called a shatagni. And that's a, some kind of a weapon that can just obliterate a hundred people with one swipe. And so Krishna sees this and he, um, he gets some arrows and he shoots these arrows and all the weapons finished with a couple more arrows, all the fighters, the elephants are finished. And so then Bomasura is left. And Bomasura takes, uh, uh, realizes that uh, he gets really angry because Gar Garuda is also fighting. So what can an eagle do? He can scratch. And so he, the, the Garuda was scratching all the elephants. He was taking his wings and hitting the fighters. And um, so Bomasura was starting to attack Garuda because he was angry with Garuda. And then 
that move, Christian got really angry. You don't attack my, car my carrier. And so he went and Bomasura had a trident, was going to kill him, and Krishna, again, with his chakra, finished Bomasura. And um, Bomasura was actually the uh, son of Mother Earth. And so Mother Earth came out, paid obeisances. I'm sure she was glad to get rid of her demoniac son. And she says beautiful prayers to Krishna. Um, many, many very nice prayers glorifying Krishna. And then Krishna uh, takes Satyabhama and they enter the palace. And when they go in the palace, all the queen, uh, all the captured uh, daughters of the um, kings were all just, they were just captivated by Krishna. And all this time, when they were captured, they were praying, earnestly play, praying that, I hope Krishna will come and save us. And then when they, they saw Krishna, uh, their hearts were just melted. And Krishna, and they prayed. They prayed, please, Krishna, can you, can you marry us? What else? Cause, uh, besides that, we're, we're finished. You know, our lives are done. No one will marry us. And so Krishna, out of his kindness, did so. And they took him back, and they had a beautiful ceremony on the level of, of all the other queens. And so this is um, showing how wonderful Krishna is and how, how he selected um, these very special... Um, Queens. And it also shows how extraordinary Krishna is, that he is beyond any conception of, of any kind of a, a god that uh, we could imagine. Um, there are, this morning I think they, uh, we were reading about frauds, but actually there are many people that are envious of Krishna, of him marrying so many wives and enjoying so much, but, and they think, well, I can. I can be like Krishna, but they're all frauds, and they start to marry. You know, there are actually many gurus. Rajneesh was one, Maharaj, Maharishi, whatever his name was, Guru Maharaji, and things like that. They thought they were Krishna. They, they should be like Krishna, and they started marrying many ladies. But they all ended up, I'm sure, uh, the same thing that happened to Pondraka, who also thought he was Krishna. Um, so we have to have great respect for for Krishna, and we can, after reading such pastimes as this, so unique, and how he um, dealt with with uh, uh, these activities. And here, at the very end, is describing how glorious these ladies were. Um, very selective, Krishna selected these ladies to be his queens. So they must have been very special, and many of them did very intensely pray, and. Um, and they were in that mood of, of complete surrender to Krishna. Um, so this is a, a mood. It's also it's a mood of love, but with a little awe and reverence, which is a different flair that Krishna has in some of the other relationships, like we heard yesterday of the uh, damsels of, of Braja. Also a loving um, mood, but in a different way. So Krishna has so many different uh, reciprocations and so many different relationships. It's unlimited. It's just unimaginable that every single one of us has a different relationship with Krishna. Um, so we should learn from here that um, no matter what it is, Krishna is, is pleased with that loving mood and he reciprocates by giving them, giving you the highest pleasure that you could ever imagine with and be very, very, very satisfied with um, that reciprocation. So these are some of the recipes for, for real love, not lust, not the uh, lust of like Bomasura and the lust in this world of so many marriages, marriages or relationships. But it, it's the recipe is that you have to be um, that you have to have a very soft heart and you have to be very humble and you have to be very submissive and 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 also uh, very selfless, not thinking about your own sense gratification which is pretty much unheard of in the material world because the material world is born out of lust, whereas the spiritual world is born out of love. Um, so we can put this into practice. Um, we're students of bhakti. We're supposed to be learning this art of loving relationships. Um, it's a study of, of how to become selfless. And it begins, first of all, by taking the vow of, of uh, becoming a disciple 
and being very submissive to whatever that guru asks you to do. Um, and that's 24 hours a day. Um, and then learning how to joyfully serve others. Not just serve, but to joyfully serve everybody and, and not expecting anything in return. And then willing to sacrifice um, that wanting adoration and distinction and recognition. Um, if we can do those things, if we can practice that in this lifetime, then maybe we'll have a little bit of, of that uh, intense desire to pray like these queens, to pray for um, becoming attached to Krishna and for him to come save us from this whole material world. So it's uh, a matter of intensifying our desires and doing our regular things. Uh, we're, not, we're not queens, we're not, we're just simple little ordinary living entities that got lost in this lusty world. So we can pray to uh, keep our vows and to keep engaged in, in this process. It's a gradual process of, of bhakti to become selfless. Um, and it, we shouldn't retire from the training. We shouldn't think, oh, now I've been doing it 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I can retire for a little while and uh, enjoy Krishna consciousness and become a little loose in my mind and a little loose in my, in my actions. But no, uh, no retirement. Uh, we have to stay strong in our training uh, up to the very end. Um, and, and be very attentive in these teachings, uh, even in this poor part, although there's so many pastimes, but a lot of, lot of uh, good instruction um, that we should read daily and we should take to heart daily so that we can make some advancement and hopefully Krishna will select us to uh, do more service next lifetime. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Okay. Uh, you said this thing we should endeavor to get Krishna as a husband and then get disturbed. Should we ask for a husband from Krishna? Yeah. Some people have, and they've been really successful. I know of a couple in this community that Krishna <laughs> that did austerities and asked deities for a good husband, and she got a really good one. Oh. I won't say who it is, but anyway. Um, so if that's your mood, it's better than maybe going on the website and looking for one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Krishna knows your heart. So um, um, you just be surrendered whatever Krishna wants. And be surrendered to, to uh, what his plan is. And... Um, but then in one angle, Krishna is reciprocating within each individual. So it's not really whatever Krishna wants. It is also our willingness, the way we want to serve him. And he is reciprocating that. Both, right? Yeah. At some point, maybe our desires will be pure, and then there won't be any question. But right now, he's <clears throat> trying to help us. Mm -hmm. And so if he sees that it, it'll help us eventually, maybe get rid of that desire, <laughs> which um, does happen after you're married for a while. <laughs> you, get, you get over that desire <clears throat> when the responsibility gets heavy. So yeah, Krishna will, um, he knows the best course of events for us. Mm -hmm. So we just have to become surrendered. Because I just had a uh, discussion the other day with a nice few devotees and they're all coming to the conclusion we need only mercy. Mercy is everything. But then we found actually, yes, mercy is everything, but to get the mercy, you have to endeavor. So without sadhana, without practicing, nobody got, I never saw any example that somebody got mercy without sadhana. It appears like, like Kaliya got mercy. But then we find he has a three more life, previous three lives. He did such a severe austerity. He was that great sage, Bhayadashira. Yeah. This life is just a Kaliya. Looks like a, without doing anything, rather it's a, uh, he did abominable things. Uh, but uh, he got the mercy. No, it was, uh, it was like a... So we can't get lazy in this lifetime. Correct. We just expect mercy. We, Correct. We have, to, we have to do 
as much service as we can possibly fit in 24 hours right. every day. Yes. Also, there's that story you know probably in uh, near Atlantic Bush Avenue in New York. Prabhupada was going for a morning walk and uh, they stopped and there was a few ducks. And this man is uh, taking a part of the bread and feeding those ducks. And some or other Prabhupada watched it from far, I guess. He said, look at this man, he's feeding that duck more. Go ask him. So they asked the man, the, why are you feeding that duck more? He said, because he's quacking more. <laughs> Prabhupada said, we need that. Yeah. So then, that was very nice. It was like it really gave me in my thought for days that we have to do sadhana, practice, 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 and then it will draw attention from Krishna on pure devotee Prabhupada, and then the mercy will come. Yeah. These, these queens were quacking. Yeah. Please say this. Please say this. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Glory to God, Father. Yeah. Something there on the chair. There is something on the chair. Just check. There's Mother Kuchi, there's one question from Mother Nanda. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that one should be equal in praise or blame. So what is the explanation as to why he feels he needs to defend his reputation in regards to the Shamataka pastime? He also says that he, that everyone should um, uh, follow he, he, do his actions, everyone will follow a great man. So he wanted to make sure that he was stainless in his activities so that everyone would follow his great example. That's the only thing I can think of right now. <laughs> <laughs>